If you're a regular viewer of my videos, you know I'm a big fan of mineral hair analysis. In this video, I want to answer a very common question that I get, which is, is mineral hair analysis even legit and scientific? Online, you will find a lot of conflicting evidence and some websites calling it pseudoscience or even a scam. In the following few minutes, I want to go over the most common objections against HTMA, and I also want to explain the idea behind hair mineral testing and why it's so often misunderstood. You will then realize how complicated nutrient testing actually is and why the standard advice of just get a blood test is pretty bad. The first criticism of hair analysis is that you get different results from different labs. There have been a few studies on this where they would send in a hair sample from the same person to different labs and then get different results. A prominent example would be a 2001 study by Zeidel et al, which is called Assessment of Commercial Laboratories Performing Hair Mineral Analysis. Now, how is this possible? The problem here is that the studies never distinguish between labs with different procedures and machines. If you want to do a good mineral hair analysis, you generally want to use inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, ICPMS. But some labs might also use atomic absorption spectrometry, AAS, or a different way of analysis entirely. Also keep in mind that most labs specialize on the detection of toxins or illegal substances in the hair, and they only do nutrient testing on the side. What that means is that before they analyze the sample, they usually wash it. But this throws off quite a few values, especially the sodium and the potassium values. To get good results, you always want to look for a lab that specializes in nutrient testing, uses ICPMS machines, and does not wash the sample before the analysis. Interestingly, in the 2001 study that I just mentioned, the two labs that I recommend were also featured, and their results were extremely close, with six out of the 10 essential minerals being identical and the other four being so close that it was well within the standard error of measurement. This actually validates their testing method. Another common critique of hair analysis is that the results you get from the labs are confusing, and this is actually true. You can't simply look at the low values and supplement them and at the high values and then try to avoid them. This is called replacement therapy and it doesn't work. Why? Because our body is a lot more complex than you might think. Let me give you an example. In many of my videos, I talk about how common magnesium deficiency is. But around 70 to 80% of people who submit a hair analysis get a high magnesium value back. How is that possible? What you have to realize is that a hair analysis just shows us what our body excretes through the hair. A high magnesium value just means that your body is actively pushing out magnesium through the hair follicles. This also means you never want to analyze a hair test based on individual nutrients. Instead, you need to learn to recognize the common patterns that come up over and over again. Only when you look at the big picture will you be able to make good recommendations that actually work. Criticism number three is a lack of reference values. Unlike for blood tests, there are no predefined reference ranges that a lab has to use to tell you whether you're within the good range or outside of it. This is definitely a valid criticism. And what many labs then do is that they simply take the average of all the results they have and assume that that's the ideal range. But keep in mind that we have a selection bias here. People who get hair analysis are usually sicker than the average population because you wouldn't get the test if you were completely healthy. But even if you were able to perfectly reflect the whole population, also keep in mind that the average person doesn't enjoy optimal health either. What that means is that every hair analysis lab is kind of on their own when it comes to defining the ideal ranges. It's not ideal, but that's the way it is. A book with good reference values, in my opinion, is Trace Elements and Other Essential Nutrients by David Watts. ARL also has pretty good ranges, and they even highlight the optimal value on the chart, which I really like. Another criticism you might come across isn't so much about the test, but about the nature of hair itself, in that hair isn't always supplied with nutrients. 
The logic is that hair has three phases, growth, transition, and shedding. And during the last, so the shedding phase, the nutrients won't be shuttled in as much into the hair follicle because blood flow is decreased. The question here would be, how do you ensure optimal readings if you happen to come across a lot of hairs that are already in a shedding phase and therefore aren't supplied with as many nutrients? It's a valid question, but very easy to fix. Really, all you have to do is sample your hair from different locations on your scalp and also not use hair that has already fallen out. I will link a guide on how to get your hair analysis done step by step, where everything is explained in much more detail. Along similar lines is the argument of environmental contamination. It says that hair doesn't only show what's inside the body, but it also picks up a lot of stuff from the environment. This is also true, and some examples would be head and shoulder shampoo raising the zinc value, heart water raising the calcium value, and Epsom salts raising the magnesium value on hair analysis. But this isn't as big a deal as people make it out to be. First of all, always report to your practitioner what type of shampoo you're using, and if you work in an environment where there are a lot of minerals, or for example, if you take a lot of magnesium baths. Also, if your hair happens to be contaminated, it's usually that one value is off the charts, which is very easy to spot. And the last criticism you might get, and this happens a lot when you talk to doctors about hair analysis, is that they don't correlate with blood tests. This is actually a feature and not a bug. What you have to understand is that hair tests and blood tests measure two different things. Blood is the transport system of our body. It reaches almost every cell and any nutrient found in it is not stored there. It's being transported around. Blood levels are a measure of one specific moment in time and a good marker of the bioavailability, so how well your body can use and transport something. Hair, on the other hand, is a tissue slash accumulation test. Depending on the sample length and how fast your hair grows, it's a measure of about two to three months of growth. It's really a reflection of what the hair follicle picks up from the blood. That means it's also a better reflection of tissue levels, which is where the actual biochemistry happens, and it helps us understand what might accumulate in the cell. Also keep in mind that because blood reaches so many parts of our body, it will always be prioritized over tissue. What that means is that if a nutrient is low in the blood, your body will just pull it out of the surrounding tissue to refill the blood again. A really good example here are electrolytes like potassium. Too much or too little of it in the blood can kill you, which is why the body does everything it can to keep blood levels stable. But that also means that if you only look at the blood value, you will almost always get normal ranges, even when somebody is already deficient in the tissue. Great, now that we looked at the most common criticisms of hair analysis and I tried to explain them, what's the verdict? Is this a scientific method or not? The answer is yes and no. It is scientific in the sense that if you use a reliable lab and they don't wash the sample beforehand, you will always get the same measurements. Again, if you're interested in step-by-step -step instructions and lab recommendations, watch my other video. But because the interpretation is difficult and your average practitioner or the average person won't understand it, they will draw the wrong conclusions. Because of that, it falls outside of the scientific consensus. It's still a very controversial method and not accepted by many institutions. Now, my response to that would be that the status quo on nutrient testing sucks. We've been doing the same thing for decades and it isn't working. There are so many people with undiagnosed nutrient deficiencies that always get told that they're fine and that they're just imagining their symptoms. In my opinion, this is probably the biggest blind spot we have in nutrition right now. And even though hair analysis isn't perfect, it's definitely a step in the right direction. 